welcome to a special edition of Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. The world, or at least this country, waits for the long-delayed Chilcot report into the Iraq war. Seven years, millions of pounds later, will Sir John, knighted by Blair, have laboured mightily only to bring forth a mouse? Or will, as last week's Sunday Times seems to suggest, the Chilcot report inflict savage criticism of Tony Blair, Jack Straw, Richard Dearloaf of MI6 and others? Peter Oborn, the most respected conservative writer in the English language today, has been on this case almost, though not quite, as long as me. His new book, Not the Chilcot Report, is in the bookstores now. And it will be almost as exciting a read as the report itself, not least because it is several million words shorter. Peter joins us now. Thanks for coming on the Sputnik. We'll come to your book in a minute. But uh, Gayatri mentioned the Sunday Times. Do you think that leak has got it about right? Well, I'm very interested in the leak. The, the, the journalist Tim Shipman, political editor of the Sunday Times, is respectable. He's claiming that as a minister, a former minister, has told him uh, all of this. Well, I think we can take him at his word. In other words, a former minister, we can take it in the Blair government. It'll be a minister who's seen the report because it's been shown to him, has gabbed, has, has, uh, has broken his promise, and he's gabbed to the Sunday Times. I see this as part of a very deliberate uh, attempt to prepare the way, um, a, a well-placed leak to uh, massage the process, and it's interesting that they're fingering Jack Straw. Uh, they're saying it'll uh, be severe. Um, I'm, um, so I think it's quite interesting. Indeed, uh, managing expectations is the order of the yeah. day in these things, and this clearly had those fingerprints uh, on it. I suppose the moot point, or there are two moot points, is will the savage criticism be reputation-destroying criticism? And will it be limited to those names that were in the Sunday Times report, in your view? Well, what it said in the Sunday Times was that it would focus a lot more than we had thought on the planning process, the disaster which happened when the British troops got to Iraq than we thought. That makes sense. It was a disaster after we got there. We, it was a humiliating defeat, in effect, for the British Army. Um, so uh, I, what I think, though, is the case is that they're going to... We seem to know that they're going to criticise maybe 40 or 50 people. Uh, and it's going to be 2.6 million words. Mm. That su suggests to me a lack What did you of, say to me earlier? Three, three times, three the, times the, the size of the Bible. Three times the size of the <laughs> Bible, five times, almost five times the size of War and War Peace. And peace yeah. Now, that suggests an inability, really, to focus on the key issues. It suggests that they're doing a scattergun approach. It suggests that they may not answer the really important questions about were the British people lied to ahead of the war? Um, was there a secret deal of some kind? Was Blair always committed to invasion? Um, was the war illegal? All these are the big, many of the big questions. I agree that the mismanagement of the occupation is very important, but the, for me, the most important aspect is the lead-up to war itself. Well, the mismanagement of the occupation is not actually of great interest to me, because being half an Irishman, I'm entitled to say, uh, when asked directions, I wouldn't have started from here. They should never have been there. Therefore, how they manage their occupation is uh, a matter of little importance to me. The, the $64,000 question, as we used to uh, describe it, is the one you've just posed. Were we lied to in the run-up to this uh, invasion? And if Chilcot doesn't deal with that, then in my opinion, it will have been seven years and millions of pounds wasted. I completely accept that. He has to... If he's going to say that we were not lied to, then he has to show why that should be. He has, because it, it, on the face of things, as I show in my, in my book on not the Chilcot Report, uh, you can look at the statements made by Tony Blair to Parliament and in the media. You can compare those statements to what we've the underlying intelligence, uh, which was, came from the uh, Joint Intelligence Committee to Downing Street, and you can show that Tony Blair 
completely misrepresented what the underlying intelligence was saying to him about the existence of, we of weapons of mass destruction, as they were called, and the threat posed by Saddam Hussein. So if, if, if Shilkot has to explain what this gaping gap, this abyss between what the intelligence services were being told, were saying to Blair and what Blair actually said to the British people. Sorry, go on. No, um, I recall you describing um, in your uh, in your conversation with uh, Blitz, yeah, the, mm. uh, the, yeah, the chief weapons inspector, exactly. Hans Blitz. Hans yeah. Blitz is that they uh, interpreted the, ex the question mark into exclamation marks, yes. that which is again, very vital. Th that oh, was okay. very in important. That uh, Hans Blitz said to me that in his fi final speech to Parliament on March the 18th, 2003, making the case to war just a day or two before everything started to move, he, he, that Blair was incredibly selective of the weapons inspector's report. He, he chose only the incendiary things. He misrepresented the things that he sold Parliament. He, he, he ch changed unaccounted for as if they actually existed and so forth. Uh, and you can show a systematic pattern of deception exactly. of the British people ahead of the wall. Well, for me, that's the, the, the countdown to my own expulsion from the Labour Party began when I accused Mr Blair on the BBC of lying at the uh, press conference immediately after the Crawford Ranch mm -hmm. Texas meeting, where it's now, I think, generally believed uh, Mr Blair pledged uh, war uh, with Bush long before Parliament had ever uh, been consulted long before he stopped saying that there was no necessity for war. I mean, afterwards he said that, uh, that uh, if Saddam Hussein and his sons uh, were to disarm, they could stay in power. And, and thus the issue for me is deception. Uh, if he is not found to have deceived us, then as you say, Chilcott has to explain this gap mind the gap, the gap between what the intelligence actually said and the conclusions that Mr Blair uh, drew from it. Let me widen it though, because I know that in this corker of a book that you've written, uh, you deal with this. Um, it would be entirely wrong in my view to hang all of this on Tony Blair, because he had a cabinet. Exactly. I have interviewed some members of that uh, cabinet who say that uh, Mr Blair never really brought these matters uh, before them, which begs the question, what kind of cabinet were they and why they didn't insist that he did. Uh, but if a cabinet has cabinet responsibility, there has to be more than Tony Blair in this frame, no? Oh, I completely agree with you. By the way, I, I, I'm on the matter of whether a deal was struck, but a secret deal, I've yet to see the smoking gun. I've yet to see the sort of the, the, the treaty signed in blood. I mean, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence, and uh, it may, it's, it's, very, it's hard to make any other sense of the pattern of events. We haven't got anything which proves sure. which proves it happened. But I completely agree with you that we. I think we need to look beyond Blair because uh, he, he was saying a lot of load of stuff which was un turned out subsequently to be untrue. Why wasn't he pulled up on that by his foreign policy advisor, David Manning? Why wasn't the chiefs of the intelligence services, uh, Jay Love, and in particular Scarlett, the chief of the Joint Intelligence Committee, Sir John Scarlett, as he now is, why didn't he complain to Blair that he was misrepresenting the material he was getting from the JIC? Very important point. Why weren't the cabinet raising difficult questions, uh, asking the right questions? Why were they content not to see the legal advice till they got a pathetic few paragraphs at the very last minute? These questions go on, and I do... Th and, and the press, by the way. I was I'm a journalist. That. I'm glad you yeah, have. I'm a journalist. And I feel... I, as I wrote that book, I started to feel a deeper and deeper shame. There were people who honourably opposed and saw through the war from the start, like yourself. But uh, there were many, I'm afraid to say I was sort of neutral on it. And I didn't, I, I now I can see writing through that, there's a lot I should have picked up at the time which I didn't do. Well, it's very honourable that you say so, and David Davis uh, is another who voted for the war, and because he did, he's also ashamed and more determined, David Davis, the Tory grandee, yes, I know. Yeah. Uh, to uh, get to the uh, bottom of this. But I'm glad you raised it, because the media was a chorus, uh, it was an echo chamber, 
of the Blairite clique at that time. And those who opposed it were treated as bad yep. or mad or both, both. Mm. Uh, when it turns out that we were uh, right. Uh, but the people in the media who were that chorus are still there today and continue to chorus government propaganda. Mm. This seems to me, therefore, a crisis of every estate in the realm. Mm. Mm. Not just the political class, yeah. the civil service, the mandarins, the foreign service, but also the the uh, media that we have. I do. Th I absolutely agree with that, and I, I I think that if you look through the people who warned against the war, how, how, what's happened to them? We all lost our jobs. <laughs> you looked, and you looked at those seriously. Who, Greg Dyke, uh, Piers Morgan, myself, and many others. We we all lost our jobs, <laughs> and. Whereas those who trumpeted the war, has anybody paid any price at all? No. Um, and so... John Scarlett is now Sir John Scarlett. Uh, no. uh, uh, the foreign policy advisor is now a knight of the of the realm. Nobody has paid a price. Scarlett was promoted. If you were so wrong, mm. as I think Choco is going to conclude, doesn't that add insult to injury that they've gone on to become... Well, well we know that it's... I mean, even when Obama well said, he said, you yeah. know, the rise of ISIS. Yes. The rise of the Islamic State, Daesh, can be traced mm -hmm. uh, to the c catastrophic yeah. of the evasion of, of Iraq in 2003. Yes. So it, we, there's no real doubt. There's no doubt at all. This was the greatest calamity of the post-war, post-Cold mm -hmm. War mm -hmm. era, and and it's led to so much else. Uh, and it's created. But just returning to Britain, it's created this crisis of trust in in, in British institutions. Because can we believe what we're told by, not just by the Prime Minister, but by the civil servants, by the, by the intelligence services? Uh, and in Britain, uh, until 2003, generally speaking, uh, you and I are from different traditions, but I felt that I trusted the British state. You probably didn't, actually. And I've come to the conclusion that you were right and I was wrong. But if you go back to World War II, well, we as a country, as a nation, united against fascism, uh, and it was the greatest moment of a thousand years of English British history. Our finest hour. Uh, you know, we, we did trust the state, didn't we? We believed in, in, in the organs of the state. Uh, and really, unless they deal with Chilcot, can deal with the, the horror of Iraq and, what, uh, and what, how it came about, I don't think we can anymore. Because it shows that the state cannot investigate itself. No. Stay with us after the break. More on Chilcot, the Iraq War with the great Peter O'Bon. Welcome back to Sputnik. Peter O'Bon, writer, broadcaster and exocet seeker after truth, has written a corker of a book, not the Chilcot Report, and he's with us to discuss the issue which will dominate the summer and beyond in Britain. Uh, Peter, before the break, we were... Uh, uh, just laying out some of the great issues that are involved. You've done a signal service in uh, producing this book. Tell us uh, who published it, what you intend to achieve uh, by it, and it's a slim volume, uh, so it's millions of words shorter than Chilcot, but I'm willing to bet it's rather more forensic than he's going to produce. Tell us about it. Well, I, I started off, by the way, co-writing it with... David Morris, Dr. David Morrison, who's been such a brilliant an analyst. He has. Uh, uh, I've, been, uh, uh, I've been the beneficiary of his advice for uh, well over a decade. David and I, as you know, wrote a co wrote a piece on a book on uh, Iran about three or four yes. years ago, saying it's yes. time to talk to Iran yes. and, and exposing the lies told about that. And uh, we, it's, it's really a joint book of ours, but we disagreed. It was most annoying. <laughs> about some issues. Uh -huh. And David being a man of enormous yeah, integrity. Tremendous integrity, yeah. Um, he refused, in the end, to put his name to it. And it was... Um, I'm really upset about that, but I want to pay homage here to his mm. contribution. Also, Richard Heller. I'm sure you know I Richard. I do know Richard also, yes. Yeah, uh, and Richard wrote several passages, long, long period. Mm -hmm. And so it's... And what he's trying to do is just set out the basic facts and the basic arguments uh, about... Um, about the lead-up to the Iraq war in principle, but we also go beyond, which Chilcot needs to address. And so you, it's 35,000 words. I'm, I'm I think it's very clearly written, 
and you can read it, and you, it gives you a way of reading the... When the 2.6 million words Comes appear, out, yeah. you can say, has Chilcot addressed this, this issue? Because yeah. we, we show that the Blair government lied about uh, to, the, to the British people. Yeah. We've set up the arguments, we've set up what is a lie, how you show that somebody's lied, and that we, we, make the, we show that the Blair government lied, and Blair was the head of that government. We show that the war was illegal. We might go through the arguments. And so, in a very simple way, the key passages... We, uh, and I think that if, and if Chilcot is going to say it wasn't illegal or he's going to say he didn't lie, then I think you, he, you can, he's got to... We, you, the, the arguments making the case that he did are there, and at least we can know if Chilcot addressed them well enough. You see what I mean? It's a yes. sort of primer. A primer, yeah. Um, well, that's very important, very valuable, and I hope that uh, people snap it up, as I'm sure they're, uh, they're uh, going to. I described the panel, the Chilcot panel, on the day that it was announced in Parliament as a parade of establishment flunkies, uh, several of whom had openly proselytized for the war, uh, and two of them in the most brazen way, one of them comparing uh, Bush and Blair to... Uh, to Truman and, and Churchill. And Roosevelt and Roosevelt Churchill. Roosevelt and... That was Sir Martin, and, the late Sir Churchill. Martin Gilbert. Yeah. Yes, this has gone on so long, some of the members have died. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I've come to think that I may have been wrong uh, about that. Uh, certainly, if it turns out to be a whitewash after this length of time, it seems to me that the establishment, the British state itself, will be taking a very great risk because the seeping away of its authority and credibility mm -hmm. will, could turn into uh, a flood. Are you expecting Chilcot to come to anything like the conclusions you have in this book? Well, I, I literally don't know. I mean, all, we've seen the, um, the, the leak the in leak. the Sunday Times we were just discussing, which, in my view, comes from Blairite sources. Mm -hmm. All the leaks will come from the, from the, from the, the old, new, old New Labour Blairite yeah, sources. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, what I'm curious about, George um, said it, mentioned it in the introduction, the world, or at least this country, is awaiting. But does he have a point? Is the world awaiting this jail report? How, is, how are the people across the Atlantic? Are they awaiting this report? Are they going to... The, is the Bush former administration going to fear something like that happening there too? For me, this is about Britain. It's about how we in Britain govern ourselves. I don't think the Americans... I mean, the Americans actually, to their enormous credit, uh, have actually looked into some of the horrors, the incredible Feinstein support, uh, reported of torture. They've, they've been much more yeah. clear-sighted about the crimes committed by, by, the, by the Americans uh, than, they've, than we have. Uh, and but for me, it's about Britain, and actually, it raises a lot of questions. Uh, we, we do we want to have this alliance of the United States? I mean, yeah. it was the alliance of the United yeah. States, a determined nation to stay with the United States, that led us. It was part of the reason why Blair. And that, it's a perfectly honourable view, by the way. But we have to do what the Americans do. We're going into war with the Americans. I think we have to answer that question. Do we want to stick with, mm. with the American hegemon? Uh, and I, because and, it's taken us into some very bad places. It has. Um, then I think you have to look, I mean, we have become, we've adopted neoconservatism. If you look, one of the interesting things is it was a neoconservative adventure, as we know, the, the, the circle around Bush. We now have, we still have in Britain a neoconservative Government, we, you know, the, the, the key figures are neocons. They, uh, they look to the right wing of the Republican Party for spiritual and uh, intellectual and political leadership. And is that what we want in this country, or do we need to sort of say, do, do we want to get involved in these uh, expeditions? Um, isn't there a, another tradition of foreign policy we might like, like to engage with? These are all great issues. I hope that Chilcot engages with those. And, and do we want to have a, a system of integrity in our civil service and in our intelligence services? Or do we want them to become uh, instruments of, of, of charismatic political leaders, as happened in the 2003 case? Mm. Well, the uh, issue of whether or not it was a crime is, I suppose, therefore still open. But the issue of whether it was a blunder is not open. Uh, as you say, President Obama has openly conceded 
that uh, it's a good lesson, he said, uh, that you should aim before you shoot. And he was unequivocal that ISIS, the phenomenon which is the gravest threat uh, in the world today, in my view, uh, comes directly out of this foreign policy uh, disaster. So that's not an open question. But on the legality, I just want to test you speculatively on this. If Chilcot concludes that we were deceived, and that we were lied to, and that the country was taken to war on a false pretext. What can we do about it? Is Alex Salmon's idea of an impeachment, or other people who talk about court action and so on, is that possible? I don't think it, I mean, think it is. I, I think it was a war of aggression. I, I think it was an illegal war. Both of these are crimes then? Yes. Yeah, they are. But I don't see the mechanism to go ahead and prosecute. Um, the, uh, the, the long legal note before the war from the Attorney General dealt with this very clearly, that the ICC, the International Criminal Court, could, there's no, could, was not authorised to deal with crimes of aggression. Britain is a member of the Security Council. And you can't, there's no real as a Security Council member, you're not going to get, get, get prosecuted for a crime of aggression war of aggression. If we can't do anything legally, we must do something politically. Blair is the uh, culprit in chief, his cabinet secondary, but the parliament also yep. has to take some responsibility. Mm. Because what is a parliament if it is not an organ that holds the executive, the government to account? Mustn't we make some change in the way our parliament works? Perhaps even make it a bit more like the American? Mm, yes, the, the American functions in a way much more democratically yeah, than right. ours does. What parliament didn't do was to expose the falsehoods which were being told it and us uh, at the time. And there was actually, uh, I showed this in the book, uh, even a, a lie embedded in the motion on the 18th there of was. March to do with the position of the French, it was misstated. Yes. Uh, and so um, the Parliament was very bad, and, and there were one or two um, Labour MPs who, who did actually start to expose that, that they were laughed at by the others in Parliament. And so, of course, Parliament failed. The media failed. It's a terrible failing by the media, as we discussed very, very, a little while very, ago. Very, very, very. And, and those who were right, you, the Stop the War Coalition, mm -hmm. Jeremy Corbyn, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and there were a number of journalists. Polly Toynbee was right, I think. I mean, there were a few journalists who got it absolutely right, but... Uh, and not all Liberals or lefts, yeah. by the way. Peter the Daily Hitchens, Mail, I think. The Daily, the Peter Hitchens was completely against oh, yeah. it. Andrew Alexander in the yeah. Daily Mail. There were many people, actually, in Conservative newspapers mm. who refused to join the, yeah. the rush uh, to war. My last point on that. Uh, it was said of the Bourbons that they, they learned nothing and forgot nothing. Uh, aren't we in the same position today? Because I still hear the same kind of Absolutely, arguments yeah. advanced mm. on other issues, other wars, Iran you mentioned, uh, the Syrian war, the uh, posture of uh, hostility towards Russia. I still hear the same people saying the same things. And it's like a, a Groundhog Day for me. Uh, yep. I'm not sure what we can do about that, but it's a real pressing problem. Absolutely right. I mean, if, when uh, David Cameron was making the argument for bombing Syria, mm. he suddenly produced this figure of 70,000 moderate rebels, mm. yes. uh, which he attributed to the Joint Intelligence Committee. Yes. I've been watching that and thinking, crikey, 13 yeah. years on. Yes. And the same thing as that. And it was another phantom. Libya, the invasion of Libya, based on the idea which the government ministers continue to repeat that there was, they were preventing a genocide. Well, you know, the, 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 the reports have since have made quite clear that there was no possibility or there's no, no, no hint of a genocide about to occur mm -hmm. in Benghazi. Uh, and I think that that is, an, so we, we are still going to war on the basis of lies. Peter Auburn, we're blessed to have you. Thanks very much indeed. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? So, the long, long, long-awaited Chilcot report. Gary Edward Drury says, 
arrest Blair first and foremost and all his blood-drenched, pitiful sheep. Terry Clark says, it's unrealistic not to expect a cover-up. That's what I think. And then Ricardo Picasso, the most important thing is that Chilco tells the truth. But I'm sure the Blair dog will. Uh, yes, that, with that we can guarantee. I don't think that it will be a cover-up because I don't think Britain can afford one. Well, that's all for today then. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. Well, you can stay in touch with us through Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik or on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.